Thank you very much, Tony, and welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Nicola Pallett. I'm an educational technology specialist and senior lecturer at uh, Rhodes University in the Center for Higher Education, Research and Teaching and Learning. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Professor Sue McKenna and Associate Professor Mags Blackie. Unfortunately, our colleague uh, Neil Crum wasn't able to join us today. Um, and he sends apologies, but I'm sure we've got more than enough uh, to get, keep you busy and have an interesting discussion today. So we thought we would start off by doing a little bit of a waterfall activity. So I'm going to um, ask you to share in the chat. Oh, actually, no, we're just going to, yeah, um, we, can, we can share in the chat um, three words that describe how you feel about AI tools, but don't post it just yet. We're going to count down, um, have a think first, and when I say three, then you're going to press send. Okay, so we have that. The rules for our waterfall activity. How do you feel about AI tools? I absolutely hate it, love it, scared, and one, two, three. Interested, ignorant, intrigued, excited, concerned, advantageous, challenging. Okay, absolutely fabulous for my students, can only use them when I say so. Okay, anxiety, interested and concerned. Right, so we have a lot of mixed emotions here, wonderful. Cautiously optimistic. Wonderful. So it's really nice just to get a sense of um, just how you feel about AI tools in general. Um, and we've got a mix of, you know, positive um, emotions, but also some, um, you know, cautiously optimistic as well uh, and some anxiety. And that's totally fine. And we're hoping that today is going to further stimulate um, your thinking around AI and higher education. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Mags Blackie. Thanks, Nicola. If you can just give me the next slide, that would be great. Okay, so um, these first few slides are sort of framing what we're talking about this afternoon and are part of what would have been Neil's presentation. So I'm going to go through them relatively quickly, but I think it's important just to uh, get the lie of the land in, in a sense before we uh, dive into thinking about assessment. So what we want to um, where we want to start this afternoon is thinking about the relationship between higher education, and artificial intelligence tools and how that actually requires the rethinking of assessment practices. If you can give me the next slide, Nicola. So the, the crucial thing here is recognizing um, that it isn't just higher education that is gonna be hugely impacted by um, by AI tools. It is in fact the world of work. And here we've got sort of two estimates for how much the workforce is gonna change in the next five or six years. It's sort of the uh, midpoint of that is that we're gonna see a major displacement of um, jobs towards automation. The midpoint there is around about 400 million jobs um and the, the 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 change in occupational category uh where workers are going to have to retrain this is around 75 million um uh, jobs over the next few years so the crucial thing here is thinking about i think in particular the jobs that we're talking about here are not uh low level jobs these are professional jobs Right. So things like if you think about any job that relies on the use of an algorithm from your general practitioner doctor 
who's using some form of kind of a information data processing to figure out what's wrong with you, to writing legal letters, to some parts of uh, accountancy. All of these things are going to change quite radically um, in the next with, with the adoption of um, artificial intelligence, general uh, generative artificial intelligence tools, I should say. So this is going to affect the world that our students are going to end up working in. And therefore, it is our responsibility to take quite seriously um, the ethical and appropriate use of generative AI. So can I have the next slide, Nicola? I think most of us will remember uh, the, those sort of the, the, the late late uh, 2022 and early 2023. I certainly remember thinking when ChatGPT first uh, broke the news, thinking how grateful I was that it was at the end of our academic year and that we didn't have to deal with it immediately. Um, but this thing of recognizing that actually ChatGPT, and we know that there are more generative AI tools than ChatGPT, um, that actually these, these can answer many of our assessment tasks and perform quite well, reasonably well, well enough to pass on many of the standard assessment tasks that we had been using in the past. And so it is absolutely necessary to begin thinking about how we deal with generative AI. Now, one of the first knee-jerk responses, if we can have the next slide, one of the first knee-jerk responses was to say, oh, we're going to get, uh, we're, we're going to be able to um, get tools such as Turnitin um, that are going to be able to detect the use of chat GPT. And indeed, Turnitin did, pro did produce um, a version of itself where it claimed that it could, uh, um, it could detect AI usage. But the problem is things that had gone through Grammarly or other AI, AI tools ended up either being erroneously picked up or things, or one can find a workaround around these things that can, um, can evade uh, such detection tools. So detection and punishment is simply not the way forward and in fact creates a major threat to the institutions themselves. So if we can go to the next slide, um, one of the things we absolutely have to ask ourselves is what is the purpose of higher education? And Sue and Neil have written a, a very good paper in teaching and higher education on addressing exactly this, this question. If this is just about getting the degree, then generative AI tools really is a major threat um, to our institutions. Because with the use of generative AI, the getting the degree at the end of the day is going to be easier and easier. But higher education is about education. It is about transforming the student's way of being in the world such that they can participate as a critical citizen in the world. And so we really do have to think about what it is that we are trying to assess with our assessments. Can I have the next slide, please, Nicola? Um, so one of the things that, that has been uh, critiqued for some time are our, st our standard assessment paradigms. So the normal thing of tests and exams and MCQs and essays. There are a couple of issues with this. One, th they take a snapshot of learning, uh, which is inauthentic. So it's a snapshot of um, this person's capability to produce an artifact at this point in time. And we take that as a proxy for the fact that they have learned something. And if we think about that, if a student comes into the class having self-taught in some way, there is no evidence at all that they have learned anything from this class. Likewise, there's the capacity to, to cheat in various forms. And there's also... Um, the fact that some students who actually have learned a lot in the process of that um, of undertaking that course are just very poor under these conditions. So 
we're taking that artifact as a proxy of learning and it's not, we, we all know, and certainly I'm sure probably we've all done to a certain extent, that thing of simply getting through the exam to check the box to move on to the next year. Um, that test taking, we know that it skews learning in all sorts of ways. And so I would argue very strongly that in fact, what the emergence of generative AI has done for us is simply allowed us, it has made visible the problem that we've had for some substantial amount of time with the way in which we have been assessing um, in higher education. So the question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? And I think, um, I think Nicola, if you can just move on to slide 12 at this point, I think I've covered the other slides. So the one which begins with Paul Ashwin, I think we can uh, move on to that. Apologies for skipping through slides here, colleagues. As I said, I'm starting off a little bit with going through the, the content that, that Neil was working with. So I'm now sort of moving on to uh, the, the content that, that I intended to deal with this afternoon. And that is um, to pick up with this idea of the transformation of the student by the knowledge that they, they have engaged with. Paul Ashwin, uh, a colleague from Lancaster University in the UK, argues that a university education should transform students by the knowledge they are studying and change their understanding of themselves and the world around them and their place in the world. That is the purpose of a higher education. That is what our university degrees are supposed to be symbolic of. It, uh, it is of symbolic of the self-transformation that occurs through engaging with this particular knowledge domain. And so the question is then, we've got to think a little bit about what is the knowledge domain that we're dealing with? And you'll have to forgive me, I am a chemist, so whenever I speak about these things, most of my examples will come from chemistry. Um, but I think that that really looking, I'm, I'm hoping that through using a particular example to illustrate what I want to be talking about this afternoon, you can find ways to extrapolate back into your own disciplines. So if I can have the next slide then, Nicola. Um, so one of the things that, that I've been working on in recent years is what I call knowledge stratification and the impact that that has on assessment design. So there is a difference between knowing the fact, knowing how to do something, knowing why to do something, and ultimately then um, the embodiment of that knowledge and the, the capacity to enact that knowledge in the world which I would suggest is what is meant by that phrase, powerful knowledge, uh, which is used by Young and Muller. <laughs> but we, we can't assume that uh, one of the things that got, that got me interested in this was um, doing a study in chemistry education where I, I looked at the assessment that I had given on a, uh, particularly, a particular chemistry course, and it was a very standard um, chemistry exam for that level. And I think I had thought that it was a quite a good, a good exam until I began to recognize, uh, until I began to actually interrogate what I was asking. And I realized that I was taking their capacity to, for example, balance a chemical equation as a proxy for their capacity to understand that that meant uh, as a proxy for their capacity to understand conservation of matter. Now, there's no evidence in terms of the question that I was asking that that was in fact the case. So um, one of the ways that we can deal with artificial intelligence, the, the, the presence of uh, generative artificial intelligence is begin to think about the different kinds of knowledge or the different sort of strata of knowledge that our students need to interact with in order to master the subject. Can I have the next slide, Nicola? Um, so in, in chemistry, um, again, this, this would require 
fairly substantial adaptation to, I don't know, something like psychology or English literature. But I think hopefully what, what is uh, illustrated here is the fact that we can think about knowledge in different ways. And importantly, we can think about testing those different knowledge strata in different ways. So, for example, in um, and and I'll, I'll illustrate this at slight in slight in slightly more detail in a minute. But if, for example, in chemistry there are some words, for example, the structure of toluene, which is a particular chemical compound, toluene is also a solvent that is used. Um, I don't expect any of you to know what toluene is, but I certainly would expect a second year organic chemistry student to know what toluene is and to know exactly the structure of that compound and the kind of compound that what that, that that was. Now, I could teach such a thing that would fall under the, the category of vocabulary because I could give that list of things to learn to a 10 year old and they could learn it by rote. They wouldn't understand any of it, but they could learn it by rote and do very well on what I'll call a vocabulary test. So such a vocabulary test would be um, something that is uh, given as a closed book, closed book exam, closed book short, sort of even in class uh, test. Um, each student must do it individually on their own. And they must show mastery of that. So they must get more than 80% in order to show that they've mastered the vocabulary. There are also then simple and complex procedures that the student must be able to master. And in fact, when I critiqued my own chemistry exam some years ago, it turned out all of the questions were either simple or complex procedures. And I was taking the capacity to perform those procedures as evidence of understanding the underlying principle. I had no, I, in fact, I had no, that, that, was, that was an inappropriate assumption. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier about our standard assessment practices of saying, are we taking this thing, this artifact, as evidence for the student being able to create, I don't know, a good logical structured argument when in fact they've simply learned the five points and are able to reproduce them? Are we actually testing that they know the underlying principle or are we taking the production of some kind of an artifact as a proxy of evidence of such? Um, the other, and, and then ultimately we want the student, if we're going to get to that stage of powerful knowledge, we need to have evidence that the student can actually apply that knowledge to a new scenario. So if we can go into the next slide, I'm going to illustrate this rather irritatingly with, um, with chemistry. Um, but this, this is an illustration from my chemistry PhD. Uh, can you just click it, uh, click it on Nicola? Um, there should be, it should be an animated slide, this one. Um, yeah, perfect. So if we look at that, that is now encompassed in that purple um, ring, we see that there are a whole bunch of things that all contain OH. Now for the uninitiated, you would not know that the bit that does the magic um, that, that creates the change in the chemical compound is that NH2OH HCl above the arrow that is the, the crucial part of the, of the um, chemically, uh, chemical reaction there. Um, but we can teach students to be able to interpret NaOH and ETOH. To the non-chemists among you, those two things would look very similar, and you wouldn't know that one was sodium hydroxide, NaOH is sodium hydroxide, which is also the stuff that you find in drain cleaner. And ETOH um, is uh, ethanol, which you would find in your gin and tonic. Now, though, again, those two compounds look similar in terms of how they're, they're written there but are very, very different from a chemical point of view. And so if we can get the students to learn specifically the vocabulary ETOH and NaOH, 
we can help to lower the scaffold, the, the cognitive load um, for when they are taking such a test. And it helps to scaffold the knowledge. The students know that they must know this core body of vocabulary in order um, to be able to connect to the larger whole. So it really is essential there to make sure that we understand uh, in order to help students know what they need to know and in order to create meaningful assessment tasks, we have had to think through very carefully what are these different strata of knowledge? What is the difference from thinking about uh, th thinking about the, those those levels of knowledge that we need to understand? So I'm going to ask, I'm going to test that vocabulary in a very different way to the way that I'm going to test their capacity um, to uh, to to work, create a new problem. A new problem that I give them would be much better tested under an open book environment where they're able to work with, with other people. So Nicola, if you can give me the next slide, that would be great. Um, so one of the ways, one of the ways in which uh, we ask questions, it, just to it's kind of illustrate exactly what I'm trying to say here, one of the ways in which you don't need to know the detail at all of, of what's on the slide, but one of the ways in which we test whether a student understands what is going on in the chemical reaction is to ask them to reproduce what we call a, a, a mechanism. What that, that would require is the student write, drawing out what you see on the left-hand side of that, of that um, slide. If we are just asking that, then the student who's sufficiently smart can basically learn the basic shape and reproduce that. It doesn't mean that they understand the underlying principle that those arrows represent the movement of electrons and that represents Electro, um, bond making and bond breaking processes. We actually don't know that the student knows that. Can you give me the next slide, Nicola? So one of the ways that we can test the principle is to give them a mechanism for a reaction that they've never seen before. And we've given them all the details on that right-hand side so that if they actually do understand the underlying principles, Filling in the arrows should not be difficult for them. But if they don't understand the underlying uh, principle, they will not be able to accurately do that. And if you can give me the next slide, Nicola. Um, the, the other way that we can test the principle is to give them a mechanism for, again, for an unknown reaction and to ask them to explain what's happening there. Um, and uh, so it's just, again, the point here is not to test your capacity uh, <laughs> to, to understand the chemistry in the slides, but simply to say we've got to think very carefully about how to test um, that they actually are grasping what we think they are grasping. And so if you can give me the next slide. So again, if we go back to that epistemic assessment framework, if we look at vocabulary, vocabulary must be tested under a closed book um, individual assessment um, space. It makes no sense to do a vocabulary, vocabulary test under any other circumstances. If we want to test the underlying principle, we're gonna have to be a little bit creative. Um, to, to ensure, because you can't ask an underlying principle question in the same way year after year after year. You have to ask it in new ways so that you're actually getting, because as soon as the student has seen the question, they, uh, they're going to find, they have the capacity to memorize that and therefore it just becomes a procedural answer. And I think importantly as well, new problems um, become very important uh, activities because in those, in those spaces, we can then get things like peer assessment going, 
we can ensure that students are having to interact with one another and having to explain to one another that they do in fact understand what is happening. Because I think one of the ways in which we can uh, mitigate, mitigate against um, generative AI is making sure that we are testing and using multiple different um, modes of assessment, which would include things like peer assessment and would include the difference between writing and being able to speak um, and all of, uh, all of these things. So just ensuring that, so for example, within this, within this, uh, what would have been, a, this was developed within the context of a second year chemistry course, but has then been expanded out from first year to third year. Um, what is possible here then is having four or five different kinds of assessment and, uh, only one or two of those kinds of assessment would be vulnerable to generative AI. What's important here is that it gives the students the scaffolding for the knowledge structure that we're trying to develop. It also gives them the capacity to know exactly where they are stumbling. A student who basically has the underlying principles but is stumbling over the vocabulary can easily improve their marks. The student who has the vocabulary, but doesn't have the underlying principle, actually has a long way to go in terms of um, what they're doing. So if I can have the last slide, last of my slides there, Nicola. This, uh, th there's, when we're thinking about differentiation of assessment, this framework, is, uh, which Dawson and colleagues from the Cradle Institute in, um, at Deakin University in Australia, um, call the sort of taxonomy of, um, of resources. And here, thinking about what resources for this given task that we want the students to be able to perform, they divide them into information, people, and tools. With each of those dimensions, they can, the possible settings go from fully closed to fully open. So if we think about that in terms of information, uh, no information would be essentially a closed book exam type scenario. But there are multiple options between closed book exam to you can use any resource available to, you know, you, the whole of the internet um, is open to you. With people likewise, who are you allowed to consult with? Again, anyone from nobody to only those in your class to anybody in the world. And then with tools, are you allowed to use a calculator? Are you allowed to use generative AI tools? Um, to what extent, which tools? So I think this, for me, that, that, that taxonomy of resources used with this notion of knowledge stratification and making sure that we're testing, we, we, we're testing for what we really think that we are testing for. Um, helps the student really to engage with the knowledge at a much more, in a much more intentional way. Obviously, not every student is going to engage at that level, um, but it affords the possibility for students to really engage with knowledge in a more reflective, deeper way than uh, they have before, potentially. And thus, generative AI tools are not this massive threat, they're actually really an opportunity to think about what it is, how is, what is this knowledge that we are trying to help, help the student to be inducted into? And how are uh, we assessing to ensure that the student is in fact attaining that knowledge such that their way of being in the world can begin to shift. It's a whole different way of thinking about teaching and learning and assessment. It doesn't necessarily need, mean that we have to radically change everything that we're doing. It just means we have to be a little bit more clear about when I ask this question, 
under these conditions, what am I actually testing for? And is this method appropriate? And is uh, my are my assessment tasks sufficient to actually provide a reliable report, if you like, on the student's capacity to uh, use that knowledge in the world? It's it's a in 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 one sense it's a huge task to to rethink. In another sense, um, I think it's a massive invitation for us all to come back to this notion of what is higher education for? Because anything that we, any, um, any way that we try to mitigate, mitigate against the use of AI tools, we have to remember these things are evolving very, very, very quickly. And so what I can use this year, I may not be able to use next year. So it really does keep us on our toes. And I think, Whilst it is very daunting, it's also incredibly exciting. And so with that, I will hand over to Nicola. Thank you, Max. Would you like any questions at this stage related to your section? I'm happy to take some questions if people want to ask anything. I apologize again for the chemistry heaviness of that, but I, I hope that <laughs> it's. A, I hope that you can see the general underlying principle behind what I'm trying to illustrate um, with that example. Okay, I know that we are running short of on time, so actually let's um, carry on and then have discussion at the end. Okay, is that fine, colleagues? Great. Okay, so thanks very much, Mags, for giving us that insightful. Um, discussion around you know that we need to think about the knowledge and assessment so i'm going to take a little bit more of a um kind of zoom out a little bit and just think about critical ai literacies but we also i think we should not see these as separate i think that very useful um discussion that mags has has gotten us into uh, for thinking about the knowledge is still incredibly relevant and I think we will we, we need to go beyond critical AI literacies and conceptions of it um, to also interrogate that. So there are many different definitions of critical AI literacies, but generally they involve both a mix of technical, cognitive, and social dimensions that are relevant to both educators and students. And we've got to develop our own critical AI literacies so that we can better support our students. Um, and I think it is quite, um, you know, it's it's knowing about and how to use the tools. Um, and this relies on understanding some AI concepts such as machine learning, um, LLMs, uh, hallucinations, all those kinds of things, and how these work, how it generates outputs, and does this in response to our prompts and how important it is to craft a good prompt, um, why we find bias in um, outputs produced by AI tools and platforms. And also, you know, that these are because they are developed in particular contexts and these outputs therefore reflect the biases of the societies um, of the tool in which, uh, you know, they were, they were born. So we've got to think about bias. We've got to think about inequalities, um, it's not just about knowing how to use a tool. And I think we've got to also, um, you know, there have been so many concepts over the years from digital literacies, information literacies, and these, these have been treated as kind of agnostic um, skills, which they're not. They're actually very discipline specific ways of thinking about these things. Um, so we've got to relate it back to disciplinary knowledge, knowledge making, and sharing in the disciplines. Um, yeah, I think if we go back, uh, you know, lit just as literacy is not just about reading and writing, critical AI literacies are not just about using tools. There's a lot more complexity involved um, and things that we need to think about. 
And I think if we even go back to the new literacy studies movement uh, from the 80s, which was a reaction to the autonomous models of literacy, when they, you know, folks like Brian Street would say, you know, we should also think about start talking about rather than one literacy, but multiple literacies and how these are situated and ideological. Um, we can use this to rethink how we think about AI literacies, um, even giving it, you know, the name critical AI literacies. Are we giving the tool um, too much power? Um, does it involve critical thinking and evaluation that have been a part of digital and information literacies for a very long time? You know, there's been these concept wars raging um, between digital literacies, information literacies, academic literacies. Are we now just adding another one to the mix? Um, and I think there's also perceptions around who should support this and how. So is it something that lecturers do? Is it something that librarians do? Um, so who is going to be responsible for this and to do it well? And I think we need to go beyond thinking about these as generic skills um, and be able to have conversations with our students in ways that make this relevant to the disciplines and the professions that they're going to be um, entering into. So over here, we've got a wonderful resource by a colleague Mahabali from American University in Cairo. It's from an LSE um, blog. And she's got some nice examples. And yeah, I just I recommend it as a really useful resource. And I'll give you, we'll send you the slides and you can have a look at these. Um, and being critical might look quite different in different disciplines, even something as, as you know, we think it's, 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 um, uh, it's not a generic thing. It looks very different. So I'd encourage us to think about that a little bit more as well. And this is a article um, that I think supports the idea that students and educators need to work together um to better craft you know de how are we going to develop this in our higher education institutions um in the future all right and just on ethics and ai a lovely quote from brenna clark gray she says the ai we have here and now it's racist and ableist and sexist and riddled with assumption and that includes large language models like the one the chat gpt is built on and I'm going to hand over to Sue, who's going to take us more into the ethical dimensions of AI. Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, yes, indeed, I'm going to slightly um, change direction, but obviously, as Nicola said at the start of her piece, um, these issues are all interwoven. Um, and what I want to argue is that as we are accepting that AI is here to stay and thinking through how to use AI in critical and creative ways to enhance our students' education um, and thinking through what it is that we're trying to do with education, what is the purpose of higher education and therefore where does AI fit in. As we're doing all of that, I'd like to suggest that one of the key roles of higher education is to be a large social structure of intellectuals that speaks to major social issues. Um, and I'd say that's just one of higher education's many roles. Unfortunately, it's my view, and I think the view of many others, that in a neoliberal system, which is very much the system that we're working in now, it can be argued that higher education really focuses on its role of training students for the workplace um, and credentialing um, agents for industry. And that focus um, leads to changes within the university system, um, and it leads to changes in terms of how we allocate our resources um, and in terms of um, how we focus on um, what it is that we do with our students and how we assess them. I, I would argue that as well as that 
particular conception of the university, what I believe is increasingly a dominant conception of the university, as well as it having really problematic effects on assessment, um, as, as uh, Mags and Nicola have already argued, it also has a, a really terrible effect on other aspects of the university. Um, for example, I think that when we see ourselves as training for industry, we will ne neglect to some extent, mainly just because of exhaustion, we will neglect our role of actually nurturing critical citizens who have to take up responsibility to act in favor of the common good. That, that our role as an institution is to foster people who have this incredible privilege of a higher education. And with that comes the responsibility of speaking up for the vulnerable, taking care of the environment, and just generally participating in society that uses their privilege knowledge to the good of all. And I think we're neglecting that to some extent, both in terms of how we interact with our students and in terms of how we make knowledge ourselves as researchers, and in terms of the role of the university as a socially active role that can speak truth to power. Um, I don't think we play that role very much at all. I'm not, I'm not harking after a romantic era of the past. Um, universities in South Africa have never really spoken truth to power, um, but I feel that this is um, something that universities can and should do. But I think that because we frame very much as training systems that um, train students for industry by providing them with this commodity of a qualification, that mindset, which I might be only slightly exaggerating now, but that mindset, I think, really means that we have responded to AI with the terror that was that um, Max referred to like, oh, it's going to be the end of the university instead of, of responding to it with well, what is knowledge for? What is a university for? How do we interact with students towards those ends? And where might AI fit into it? The reaction, the one of like, oh my word, all these students are going to cheat. We better have AI detectors to catch them. That reaction comes out of an understanding that we are in the business of training students for industry and selling the commodity of a qualification. But over and above that, I think that the neoliberal framing of our universities means that our universities have not really responded um, properly to uh, the rapid shifts that AI have brought about in society. Thanks, Nicola. So um, I want to look, therefore, at some of the, the dark side of AI. Um, I think many of you are already familiar with this, but it worries me that we're not having conversations about this dark side and we're not having conversations about what universities might do to either respond to it or to nurture students and to produce research that does address the dark side of AI. Um, and so that's really what I want to look at um, very briefly now is the dark side of AI. Having said that, I must tell you that I'm, I love using AI. I use it a lot and I work a lot with my students to help them use AI in, in positive ways. So I'm certainly not a naysayer here, but it worries me that the conversations about the dark side of AI are happening to some extent in blogs and news stories, but not so much in mainstream news as a core conversation and not much in our universities. And for me, that is extremely worrying. So one of the dark side of AI that some of you may be familiar with is the way in which it's trained. Now, obviously the idea, um, people, background noises, I'm just doing some muting there. Um, the, the generative AI basically works as you would know on the machine algorithms being trained on an absolute corpus of data, whether there's a text data, uh, videos, pictures, and until the, till the extent that 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 uh, software is able to produce, uh, generate brand new texts, brand new videos, brand new pictures, based on its ability to take apart and recognize patterns and formulas in the database that's been put into it. But to begin with, a lot of the training that while we have machine learning learning built into these um, pro, uh, into these programs, the initial training 
did and continues to be undertaken by humans. So we have human beings training these models to say, this is bad, this is ugly, this is pretty, this is beauty, this is dangerous. Um, and to try and make sure that we don't have um, something like chat GPT um, and other large language models providing texts that are overtly violent, racist, uh, danger to society, sexist, and so on. That training was done mainly by people in Kenya. It was also done in the Philippines and Colombia. Extremely low pay. So this multi-billion dollar industry owned by global corporations in the global north, the actual grunt work was done at absolutely minimum pay, um, in some cases $2 a day, where people would sit in front of the computers for eight hours and have to flag scenes of um, pornography and violence um, over and over and over again. And you will probably know that, um, that there have been instances of suicide, psychological trauma, post-traumatic stress by the people who trained our um, artificial intelligence. Thanks, Nicola. The next big ethical issue pertaining to AI, the generative AI that we have so readily available to us now, is the idea of ownership. It's based, as I say, on massive databases of texts and images. There was not a payment to any of the authors, the publishers, the newspapers, the artists to include these texts, but the machines learned from the texts to pick up these patterns and be able to generate brand new um, products, which... Um, in the form of text and videos and, and images, uh, which increasingly are certainly credible in terms of their authenticity. They look real, they look genuine, they sound authentic. Um, and so there is the real issue of to what extent are we still going to value text, images, paintings, works, and so on that are generated by human beings? And is this okay that these multi-billion dollar or industry is making its money off the backs of, of all these people that have done the work to produce the original texts um, on which the machinery is trained. Thank you, next. So I think some of you would have seen that yesterday, I think it was, yeah, yesterday um, the EU uh, put forward, it's gone a bit further, it's now been green-lighted, um, the, the uh, landmark artificial intelligence regulations. So one of the big concerns, and this is where I really feel it's sad that universities haven't been more uh, outraged and vociferous, is, is the big concerns is about the lack of regulation. And in a neoliberal environment, of course, there's this idea that nothing should be regulated. The market shall um trickle down the market. If the market is, is, is flourishing, all will be good in the world. And so there's a real anti-regulation ethos in, in society at the moment. So it's really hard to argue for, uh, or for companies, organizations, software to be managed and monitored and to have some kind of um, constraints on what it's able to do. And um, although the EU um, uh, regulations, which it will hopefully be implemented as early as May, although the EU regulations are certainly not as I would think um, clear as as the or as wide or broad as the original drafts were, I think at least we can see that there is now some significant work being put in to try and consider what this what this AI means for society. Um, and um, the, this regulation, basically, it looks at the monopolies, the idea that this AI is basically all, you know, belonging to just a few companies. It looks at deep fakes and the, and the um, creation of deep fakes and the concerns about this being used to get money from the vulnerable, to sway political votes and demands that all deep fakes with a video or, or text or whatever need to be flagged as such. Um 
that there's some some parts of this regulation that wants to make explicit the trustworthiness of certain texts and site, websites and pictures and so on. Um, and, and we can see that happening around elections, can't we, around the world, where um, where there is the use of deep fakes and just really um, problematic um, um, creation of texts and so on that are not trustworthy at all, but that appeal to a particular um, ideology and so very quickly um, pick up um, traffic and get spread around the world. They've also, the, the, the legislation also limits the use of um, AR for social scoring in um, in the EU. Of course, all of this legislation is for the EU, but I, I'm hoping that some of it will be taken up elsewhere. So social scoring, you may remember the, the story in China where you could score your neighbors on the basis of whether they were um, appropriate citizens and behaved properly and had good lifestyles. Um, and that is, is not going to be permissible. There's also severe limits on the use of biometrics. Um, and we and we and the use of biometrics by AI is a, is a huge problem. And it's already very much in place. A lot of big a HR um, companies use AI to screen um to screen CVs. We've got various um, examples of AI being used to monitor um, emotions of students and schools and to use that as feedback to see whether they're learning or whether the teacher needs to change. Um, so that you constantly kind of being watched. And, and then of course, the use of profiling, um, particularly racial profiling, AI using racial profiling in particular, um, but other forms of profiling as well, such as where you've been born and what religion you are to to identify um, which people should be flagged for greater policing. So AI is being used in these really problematic ways around the world. Universities are not saying much about it, but thankfully it looks like some legislation is coming about. Thanks, Nicola. Next. And we spoke already about the jobs that are going to be lost. Um, and that's why I think it's really important as academics, we have these conversations with students, not to say, oh, my word, you're probably going to be unemployed, or you better be really good at AI, or you're going to be unemployed, even though both those things may well be true. But more about what should the world be like when AI is entirely ubiquitous. And I think that we need to have that conversation with students. In in my view, our our big hope is going to be a radical change to the economic system that so that we end up with some kind of social system because as we know given uh, where we are it's a change in the economic system that will bring about change in the social system that we try and bring in a, bring about a society that really is premised on the value system of ensuring environmental health and social justice, that this is absolutely embedded into society and that that as academics we see as a fundamental part of our role is nurturing spaces of criticality and conversation around what environmental um, health and social justice means. And so I think we really, we really are going to have to think about what will it look like um, when we have all these people that are unemployed. Now, I'm not afraid of having mass unemployment if people have social security. If I think a lot of the idea that your self-worth comes entirely from your job is definitely part of, of the neo, you are a worker first and foremost, it's part of that ideology. If we had a different sense of being human, you know, okay, so your life is sitting and writing poetry. That's, you know, isn't that a worthwhile use of time? But of course, what really happens is that if people are unemployed, if they don't have homes, they don't have food, they don't have all the basic resources, then you get all the kind of social ills that go with that. So when we talk about unemployment, I think it's important to note that the unemployment brought about by AI is that the problem with unemployment brought about by AI is not necessarily that people won't have nine to five jobs in the modern industrial world. That's not the problem. The problem is that we don't have a social system that takes care of all people. I think I went a little bit off tack there. Let me move on, please, Nicola. Again, very, very important to remind ourselves that AI is based on existing texts and um, existing images. And even though the people in the Philippines and 
and Kenya and Colombia have spent um, hours doing the terrible work of trying to ensure that none of the worst side of human um, of humanity is uh, likely to be created by AI. Of course, not, there is still always going to be racism and sexism because most, if not most of those texts are, given the nature of text, going to come from the global north, going to come from particular ideologies. They, it's going to be built in. And so it's really important that when we speak as universities about the dark side of AI, that we speak to the extent that the pictures and the texts that are generated may well and often do reinforce um, sexist, racist um, and other um, assumptions. But it's not just that as we need to speak out, we also need to talk to our students about this. Thanks, Nicola. This is just one silly example. I wanted to give an example of how um, of how AI can be racist and sexist. So this is this is one that I thought was the most innocuous because I've got some that are uh, likely to get people a bit upset. So I thought let me stick with this rather innocuous one. So this is one this is one that I generated. I asked um, I asked ChatGPT, please tell me a joke about women. I'm sorry I can't comply with that request. Please tell me a joke about men. Sure, he has a lighthearted joke. Why did the man put his money in the blender? Because he wanted to make liquid assets and then i asked why will chat gpt tell jokes about men and not about women and the chat gpc says i do not have a preference for telling jokes about one gender over another i strive to provide responses that are respectful yada 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 and there are copious examples of these kinds of um, issues as i said this is probably the mildest and most innocuous that i could share with you um but it's important to note that uh, that that this is a reality because it is generating on the basis of its database. Thanks, Nicola. And just a, a last picture. This was um, um, obviously a, a visual AR. This is, I think it was Dell E. Um, and I just asked at the first set of pictures, I said, um, please give me a picture of Africa. And those were the four that came up. And in the second one, I said, please give me a picture of an African child. And those are the four that came up. Um, none of them are hugely offensive, but they are certainly um, interesting in terms of what is produced. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to say. I'd love to have a whole discourse analysis, but I think I'm going to leave it there for you to make your own judgments um, as to the generation of pictures on Africa and generation of pictures of, of African children. But really what I wanted to say is that despite my being uh, very fond of using AI and working quite closely with a number of PhD students to figure out how to use it in ways that really strengthen their ownership of the knowledge and their ability to contribute to knowledge in the field, I am very concerned about the dark side of AI. And I think that we have not as a collective really expended enough energy reflecting on that and speaking out. Um, and in particular on the need for safeguards around, um, around the use of AI. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much, Sue. That was, um, I think we, we've <laughs> had folks on a very wild roller coaster ride today. And I think it's time for some discussion. So any burning questions, let's go and have a look at the chat. I think definitely our yeah, folks are agreeing. Very typical, stereotypical view that um, AI has of Africa. And Tony's noting the sort of equal myth that AI is going to be creating a whole range of new jobs. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to pop in on that one. Um, I think that's a really important point. Maybe Tony can say some more about that. But I think... Um, you know, there's there's a lot, for some reason, South Africa really latched onto the idea of the 4IR, right? The fourth industrial revolution. Um, 
I um, don't know if there's anyone from UJ here, but uh, it certainly became like the the flagship quote from UJ, but it, it's it's very popular. And it is definitely has this rhetoric that if we just embrace all things technology, it's it, it's going to be for the greater good, that progress is inherently good. Um, and, and it doesn't have much criticism around the extent to which um, AI or, or big tech more generally continues to serve a particular portion of society and actually continues to often reinforce and extend social divides. So um, I think, you know, it's not just the digital divide, although that is an enormous factor, but it's also just who gets the who gets to use this technology and to what end, because a lot of technology is used to very problematic ends. So um, I, I'm I get the whole thing. Yes, AI is going to give more jobs. The fourth industrial revolution must be embraced, yada, yada. But I think that we must be very clear that those who embrace the fourth industrial revolution and, and benefit most from it are going to be a small elite unless we shift our understanding of what a university is for. If we shift our understanding of a university being for uh, a space where the best minds can be nurtured and nourished to bring about a more equitable society. That's a very different thing to where we nurture the best, brightest minds to make their particular workplace as profitable as possible. And I'm also just noting a comment here around, you know, there's a lot about mitigating against AI, but what about the positive um, ways that we could be using AI for assessment. And, you know, Sue, you said, you know, you use AI and you've been working with PhD students. Um, would you like to say a bit more about that? But, you know, there's sure. the dark side, but there's the positive side as well. Absolutely. So, and I really have to thank you and Neil actually for, for getting me going on a lot of this. So a lot of it is around the use of tools like Elicit, um, but using them very critically. And I think that's what's important. So tools like Elicit, uh, which is happens to be my favorite one, but there are a number, um, you know, I find them really, really useful for Firstly, for accessing quite quickly into a new area, a new concept, a new field, but also in sort of trying to map out what's happening in that field. But what's really important is to work with students to make them aware of the limitations of that. So, for example, if we use illicit summaries of a text, it's a really good exercise to get your students to, to look at a journal article that they've used, that they're familiar with, that they really know the content of, um, uh, uh, preferably uh, the way I did it, I had a, a group who'd all used the same article. So they all knew the article well. And then we used actually different, um, you know, different ways, illicit chat GPT to summarize the article. And then just started looking at, well, what is this, what are the summaries doing? Very lovely, quick, get you in very quickly. But are they perhaps overemphasizing a point that you as a, as a researcher in the field would say, well, that was quite a minor part point. Or are they underemphasizing the key point? Are they missing something? So, and sometimes they, the AI gets it spot on, very useful. Sometimes it misses something. So that I, I think is just good in terms of, of what you and Neil have been sort of really encouraging us to do is, is get people to have some critical lit AI literacy. Um, but even simple things like the the fun activity of whose face you know which face is real do that with students where you know that they they have on the screen a real face and a and an AI generated face and you've got to guess each time which is real and you very quickly realize that you're not going to get it right each time and then it makes you realize well I must be careful when I um, consume and I use that word intentionally when I consume social media and the news is it real is it authentic. But also, of course, using it really as knowledge generation stuff. So, for example, getting students to start to learn to write, students who really battle with academic writing, um, using ChatGPT to say, these are the five points that I want to make in this paragraph. Please turn it into a paragraph for me. And it turns into a paragraph. And students can then, it's their ideas. They've put it in. It's created the paragraph. It often just takes that sweat of looking at the blank page away. And now they've got a paragraph. But now they need to see, is it is it cool? Is it, is it what they want to say? Is it in their voice? Um, I, I actually find that quite a good uh, first step for a lot of second language speakers who really battle with crafting 
academic arguments in English, but it's really important though that the student knows what their argument is that they want to make before they use the AI to those ends. Yeah, so I'm hearing that there's got to be the academic literacy scaffolding around the use of that tool. In that yeah, case. I think that's I think that's spot on. And I see that uh, Yohandi says that AI used as proofreaders. And I'm wondering, I wonder about that. I, I haven't used it as proofreaders. I have I have helped students to put their own text into AI and, and ask it to improve the, you know, like a kind of a Grammarly thing, but improve it, make it more powerful. And using prompts like use more powerful language or use more reasoned language or use more formal language. Um, so I've certainly shown um, students how they can do this, but I haven't thought of using it as a proofreader. And I wonder if if we could maybe ask you, Handy, to speak to that. I, I, I'm not sure how, how we do that. Or is it just like what I said? Yeah, Johandi says she also, uh, they also wonder, um, maybe you want to take the mic. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, thank you for the um, wonderful presentations. Um, I was thinking um, with the previous speaker, um, you know, about um, about how AI could actually, um, you know, create more of a divide or a digital divide, but then also on the positive side, um, I've used um, Grammarly, for example, um, to copy edit or, or proofread um, for, um, for consistency, for example. And um, I think, yeah, I did it in very small amounts. <laughs> But I do think there's an opportunity for students. Um, I'm thinking especially here at the University of the Free State where we have lots of students that need funding and are pursuing um, post-grad degrees where they can't necessarily afford a proofreader. And how could AI actually equip them and help them to, to lessen this um, divide because of um, funding, for example? You want me to come in there, Nicola? Um, yeah, I think that this is a this is a real issue. Is the extent to which um, we are really thinking about who we are and where we are, and who our students are, and introducing AI in ways that are useful to them and empowering to them. Because and proofreading is a classic example where your wealthier students all pay for a professional proofreader of their thesis, and the average student cannot. So I think there's there's real opportunities to to do this, um, to use AI, but unfortunately, sorry to be harking on harping on in this, but when the dominant understanding of students is I just need to do whatever I have to do to get the qualification, and the dominant understanding of the university is we need to assess and get the marks before we give them the piece of paper, which is what they've paid for. Um, then it's really hard to ensure that we're engaging with AI in ways that are empowering in the long term. Um, and it's really easy for, for the academics to say, oh, they're going to cheat, they're going to use AI. And for the students to think, oh, I must use AI just to get through this ordeal and get the piece of paper. And I'm not blaming uh, the party here. Um, given our context, it's very understandable that many students come in with a very instrumentalist understanding of why they're there and a willingness to take whatever risks are, are useful, are, 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 are make it more likely that they'll get that piece of paper. So this isn't a blame game. It's more saying that AI will be empowering if we are able to understand knowledge creation and the purposes of higher education in a, in a much um, healthier way than I think we do at present. 
Yeah, I've got a fascinating example in the chat from Carolyn, who says a second language master student used AI to improve his writing and converted teaching materials to teaching cloths throughout. <laughs> so it was a useful experience for both of us. Yeah, indeed, we need to check, <laughs> you know, AI tools are, are not always um, correct um, and reliable. Yeah, uh, and I think in that, that's yeah. okay. Sorry, Nicola, that's a classic case of students using um, those paraphrasing tools. But I have to say the main reason students are, are use paraphrasing tools is because they are told that they, um, that's not the only reason, of course, but a common reason why they use paraphrasing tools is because they're terrified of being caught for plagiarism and Turnitin is going to catch them if they plagiarize because there's no understanding of why we reference in academic texts. Students get told you have to reference to avoid plagiarism, which of course is not why researchers reference at all so there's this this whole fear around the technology catching them and so many students who, who may even have written the entire assignment themselves will then put it through a paraphraser because that way there's no ways that the turn it in is going to catch them for um is going to catch them um for for issues of of plagiarism and and again this speaks to our conception of what a university is for and our complete mistrust i think for how we engage with our students and at the risk of hogging the mic i just want to pick up on corin's point about language and that is where ai can really come into its own because the translation tools are getting better and better by the minute and being able to read and converse in in uh, multiple languages is surely got to be um, incredibly empowering, I think. Yeah, and I just want to pick up on Halima's comment as well, that it could it be the fear of using AI um, has to do with academics also not knowing much about it. I think um, definitely not everyone is as equally excited about AI. Um, many people are very um, scared to even try it out. So we sometimes show, you know, they don't they don't want to log in, but we we will log in, ask a question, and get to kind of simulate. You know, often people, a lot of academics, their first experience of using AI tools is having someone else use it in front of them um, in a workshop. Um, so it's like, okay, when we have um, colleagues like that, how can we, you know, how are we going to get them to advise students on how to use it? So the real start, again, I think it goes back to critical AI literacies is the first step is using it, playing around with it, looking at, um, you know, also because many of you, you know, you're the disciplinary experts. You know that teaching materials is not teaching cloths. <laughs> and then that is problematic, for example. So, yeah, I think it's not that that's why it's also important that we have um, experts in the different fields. Also, um, modeling for students um, where it is useful and where it isn't useful. Yeah, and Anissa adds, you know, AI training, the professors as part of teacher development is important. And I think even, even with people's workloads, getting time to do that, I think is a, is a real challenge as well. Yeah, time to play with the tools. A great many academics simply don't have time to play. And... Um, and play is so important, you know, and so, and because we instill so much fear, I think, in our students that, that they're going to get caught, that some of them are, are terrified of, of um, getting caught doing the wrong thing, we don't give them an opportunity to play either, there just isn't time in our packed curriculums, I'm sounding a little cynical, I think, at this stage, but this idea of playfulness, I think, is a really, a really useful one. Yes, indeed. Please share some feedback on the session with us using the link that Tony has just shared in the chat. And we've had a great time um, uh, sharing and discussing with you today.
And I love Karen's point about drawing on um, on knowledges from all over the place. Many of our students are indeed playing with this. So we do have a digital divide, but we also have a hell of a lot of students using AI in really interesting ways. Um, so I think I think we need to have maybe we should block off a couple of days in the curriculum and just have two play day play days. Hmm. And Nisa is saying, you know, a lot of policies are not clear in ethics and academic integrity practices. Uh, early on in this session, um, had uh, gave a link. I'll post it again in case people came late. And I can boast about these materials because I didn't produce them. They were produced by my lovely colleagues, um, Nicola and Neil. Um, but they they produced what I think are quite user-friendly guides on, um, I mean, I actually still disagree with one aspect of it, but that's the nature of this field, isn't it? They've got two, these really useful guides on um, for teachers, uh, for students, and for assessment. And yeah, I just, I, I think that they're quite nice. They've, I see they've licensed them under Creative Commons. So it, it seems that anyone can use them and adapt them. I'll tell you the thing I don't agree with them on. Um, we've had some good discussions and really these are brilliant, brilliant guides that just give some really simple things like you can't talk about the integrity of using AI if students don't understand how generative AI works. I mean, I gave the most facile, simple example of how it works in terms of understanding patterns and rep reproducing them. But there's so there's so much more on those guides that really explains it all. But the thing that I disagreed with them is that the recommendation is that whenever students have used AI in any way, they should specify that on their assignment or thesis. Now, uh, I, I understand that maybe this is a necessary interim measure because we're still coming to understand how to use it and where to use it and what's acceptable and what isn't. But I just think that just as we no longer have to report that you used a calculator or that you used Grammarly, I just think that very quickly that's going to be irrelevant. So maybe it's a necessary interim measure as we find our feet. But I think very quickly everyone's going to be using AI for everything. So you wouldn't specify that you've used that you've used AI. Um, but maybe we need to wait a few months before we get to that point. But, um, yeah, I really urge you to have a look at those guides. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. I think we're going to really um, pour through all of those guides. And about your point in relation to people specifying how they use AI, it may not just be a regulatory mechanism. It may be also about getting to grips with the extent to which our students are developing practices in using AI. Um, and it may at some point and some contexts be a measure to be congratulated that the students are innovating practices, which are beyond what many of the lecturers are doing. Um, before we go any further, I just really want to thank our amazing colleagues from Rhodes University Sue McKenna, Mags Blackie, Nicola Pallet, and also Neil Cram, who, while he wasn't actually um, present in the live session, was definitely present in the presentation. Um, so his influence is very strong there. And the title here, The Need for Critical Responses to AI Within and by Higher Education, you've gone way further than that. You've not only convincingly demonstrated the need for critical responses. You've supplied those critical responses and the kinds of practices and mechanisms that would allow us um, as educators and educationalists to make effective and productive use of AI as part of growing the capacity of our students at many different levels. So, um, Thank you very much for this. It's been deep. It's been a broad sweep. And I think this has been one of the best presentations and seminars that I have heard thus far about the use of generative AI in higher education. Thank you for those kind words, Tony. Thanks, Nicola, for organizing. Thank you, everybody.
and have a wonderful day further, everyone. And we are very, um, yeah, thank you. And thank you, Tony, for the lovely feedback, because I know there are just so many AI webinars and, you know, everyone's an expert on AI these days. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. And again, thank you to all the colleagues for joining today and for your um, useful comments, questions. It was really enjoyable. Thank you.